John Verveke and Sean Coyne have together authored a new book, Mentoring the Machines. It's a book about artificial intelligence and the path forward that further develops the arguments of how to align artificial intelligence to human flourishing, and it sets those arguments into beautiful and accessible writing. So welcome everyone. Uh, this is gonna be a special Voices with Verveke series that I'm doing with my uh, frequent inter interlocutor and friend, uh, Jordan Hall. Uh, we've done a, a bunch of series on faith. Uh, we've done series on sacred on uh, uh, and uh, different ideas about um, the, the way the meaning crisis is intersecting with the sort of acceleration that uh, Jordan continually puts his finger on uh, of, uh, of complexity. And I proposed a topic to Jordan, which I thought might give us some additional uh, conceptual vocabulary, theoretical grammar. And I'm also gonna po also point to a third thing it might give us, which is, and I'm gonna argue for this, I, I, Morton doesn't, but uh, uh, I'm gonna argue for this, a religious attitude um, that may be uh, appropriate to bringing about what uh, he advocates for, which is attunement to reason. Before we begin, I wanna acknowledge that a lot of this comes out of, uh, I read uh, Hyper Objects by Morton in collaboration with my good friend and colleague, Dan Chappie. And I'm not gonna keep referencing him, uh, but I just wanna acknowledge that, you know, uh, my thinking is shared with him because uh, we read the book together and collaborated together. And so when I proposed this to Jordan, Jordan thought that was a great idea. He is familiar with the term, uh, but uh, he wants to uh, get into it more. And so there's two things we kind of want to explore here. Uh, one is more properly, you know, what is a hyper object and what are, what's the nature of their existence? And then more long-term, um, what's the relevance of this? Um, and I have a specific proposal about that. And the proposal is going to go something like this. I'm going to use uh, a, a great literary ex uh, example as an analogy. In The Republic by Plato, Plato tries to understand what it is to be a just person. Uh, and the psyche is, of course, very hard. And so what he does is he blows it up and he creates a corresponding model of the Republic, hence the name of the book, a, a city. And by having that larger picture that's external to our own identity, we can get a, diff a, a better idea of justice. And then what we can do is move back and forth between uh, the justice of the psyche and the justice of, uh, of the city, and that actually affords our transformation in a process that he calls the ascent or pedagogy. And what I'm gonna propose is something very similar is being argued for by Morton. The appearance on our individual and cultural radar of hyper objects is startling. He calls it a quake in being. But if we pursue it carefully, we come to realize that the hyper object, according to Morton, actually reveals properties of every object, of everything. And therefore it, it, it demands from us a fundamental transformation on our relationship to all of being. And so, and that's why it has, as I said, this transformative, uh, you know, uh, religious aspect to it. So how does that sound, Gordon, as a, as a way of going forward? Awesome, <laughs> that sounds <laughs> great. Okay, so I thought what I'd do is I'll, I'll, I'll go through the four sort of central properties of hyper objects while talking about a couple of examples. Um, so let's take two examples. Um, and I choose them because they come from sort of different domains um, in some senses, but not in others. One is the process of evolution. And then the other is global warming. Okay. Now, what are some of the properties that we should note about these um, these entities? Well, first of all, they are some, they are in some sense entities. We we think of them as having an existence. They are they form some kind of intelligible whole to us, although we'll have to negotiate that intelligibility. And, and, right, and they're not just an aggregate of other things like a pile of rocks or something like that. They, 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 they have behaviors, causal behaviors that can be attributed to them as a whole. And also we can see them as having parts that are coordinated together, et cetera. I won't get into the deep ontology, but the idea is 
they form a respectable unity in our mind. But that what's unusual about them is they don't have the kind of unity that we attribute to our prototypical object. So here's my jackknife. This is a prototypical object. Notice it has parts and the parts interact, but notice what it, I can do with it. It is local. It has a determinate Cartesian coordinate specificity in time and place. And here it is, here it is. And if it's here, it can't be here, right? Now it can, it, right? it can take up a continuous space, but it is localized. Now the first important property about hyper objects like global warming and evolution is they're non-local. You can't point and say there, you know, in, 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 in Wisconsin, right? There's evolution. It's like, well, no, it, well, like, what do you mean? Evolution doesn't work. It's not, you can't point to a particular time and space. Now, that doesn't mean it's an eternal object like two plus two equals four, because it's taking place in time and space. So this is very tricky for us. We have these two sort of categories we've developed in the West, the concrete, there it is, time and space, the abstract, not in time and space, two plus two equals four. And then we have the strange intercategorical non-locality of uh, things like evolution and global warming. And let's remember that when things are intercategorical, they horrify us, they terrify us because they, they, they point to the cracks in our intelligibility. This is Mary Douglas's classic proposal as to what is horrifying. Okay, so they're non-local. Now, what I just said points to the second uh, feature, which he calls their viscosity. So it's tempting when we start to think about hyper objects to, right, to either try to picture them as concrete objects or to do the opposite in, with which we can be intimate or point to them as abstract objects that we can then distance ourselves from in detachment and reflection. And the problem with evolution and global warming is we can't do that. They are simultaneously abstract and intimate. Evolution is happening in me right now. It's happening in Jordan right now. It's happening in all of you, but, but that isn't the sum total of evolution. Evolution's all, all also happening in Australia. It's happening in Africa. It's happening in Asia. It's happening in, it happened in the deep past, it's going to be happening in the deep future, a future and a past without us, without us. It transcends in that manner. So this is what he means by viscous. We are stuck inside of them. They are bigger than us, but we are stuck inside of them. So our usual strategies of control over the concrete and detachment uh, through with the abstract are not available to us. So we have to have another way of relating uh, to these kinds of realities. The third thing uh, about them is what he calls temporal undulation. They, <laughs> they resist our, our sort of temporal grasp. He makes a really interesting point. He says, we're pretty good with the small finite and the infinite. We can go, yeah, yeah, I get that, I get that. But the really, really large is actually very hard for us. Um, and so when we're starting, when we, like the timescales of evolution, um, the timescales at which um, global warming or other things are happening exceed either the finitely graspable or the abstract infinite. And so again, we are like, this is what I mean by temporal undulation. They, they come into our time space, right? He gives the example of your, it's raining now and it doesn't usually rain, but because of global warming, it's raining. So the raining is global warming. Or the fact that I'm getting more sunburned is global warming. But of course, that's not the whole of global warming. The global warming is also due to, you know, uh, the processes happening in the sun and tectonic things happening on the earth and centuries of process of human activity, et cetera, et cetera. So if I can put it this way, um, the temporal undulation is like, it's the Heraclitean aspect of hyper objects. They're in this kind of perpetual flux that transcends our, our ability to, to fully grasp it. The next thing is what he calls phasing. This is that to represent hyper objects, we often 
that I have to re rely on a multi-dimensional phase space. We can't actually track it in sort of Euclidean space. We have to have multi-dimensional spaces. And, and in, in, you know, and some of you who know about you know, chaos and other theories, we find attractors in that phase space. And, that, and then the attractors, because where does the attractor exist? Is it abstract? Uh, is it concrete? Ah, right? Is it inside my thought? Is it merely nominal? No. Is it just like, ah, right? Uh, so, and this is, this is the Parmidian aspect. There's this aspect because the attractor is kind of timeless and spaceless, right? When the point is the hyper object is both in Heracleidian flux and also the, this Parmidian attractor in multidimensionality. Now this brings out an implication that that Dan and I drew from Morton's work. Doing all this is not something like tracking hyper objects is not something that can be done by individual cognition, the way it's bound to particular temporal spatial phenomenology. In order to view this multidimensionality, for example, we need multiple human beings, multiple machines, multiple observations, multiple laboratories, et cetera, et cetera. We need massive distributed cognition to be able to come into a cognitive grasp. Now this thwarts the hugely individualistic models of epistemology and cognition we have been developing since the enlightenment. So this is also problematic for us. The next is what he calls interobjectivity. And this is the hallmark of the, the, the species of uh, speculative realism that he comes from, which is called object-oriented ontology, people like Graham Har Harmon um, and himself. So he says, we, we have this well-developed notion of intersubjectivity, the way you're in me and I'm in you, and we are, I'm indwelling the other, I'm internalizing the other, and they're doing the same, we have intersubjectivity. And he says, I want you to think of that as a species of a broader genus, interobjectivity. All objects, independent of human being, are, are doing that with each other. Every object, right, is, right, it is, it is being internalized by uh, objects and objects are indwelling other objects. And then he points to features, I'll use some of my language because object-oriented ontology resists two, it resists, it resists what they call overmining and undermining. Undermining is to reduce something to its components. Overmining is to reduce something to its relationship to other things. So the object always has a moreness beyond its relations and beyond its parts, and a suchness beyond its relations and beyond its parts. The moreness is how there's, there's, it's an inexhaustible fount of intelligibility, and the suchness is it has a non-categorical being that we can't ever fully capture no matter how many categories we pile on top of each other. And so the idea is, and this is what makes it a form of realism, is that objects independent of human knowledge or representation are, are appearing to each other and withdrawing to each other in a profound way. And hyper objects, what does that mean? Is that hyper objects are, are made out of, but you have to resist overmining and undermining when you hear this, they're made out of other objects, other hyper objects. There's this weird nesting in which the parts present to the whole, but withdraw from the whole, the whole presents to the parts, but withdraws from the parts. And so you have, and that's what makes it real. And so I wanna now say something, I think, and so in the book, and he talk, there's quite a bit about aesthetics and, and about an aesthetics of trying to grasp the horror. All of this, right, is about, induces a kind of horror in us because of all of this deep intercategory intercategoric intercategorical being that we nevertheless can't control or withdraw from okay so part of what you can see speculative realism doing is it's trying to bring back and this uh, this is you can see in the other branch of speculative realism whitehead the dipolar nature of real of reality reality has is janus phase reality means that which we can confirm notice what i'm doing here it's like the walls of my home, this is reality, it's home. And what Morton is arguing is that hyper objects remind us in an unavoidable way of the horror side, the horror pole 
of reality. That reality is always that which exceeds our categories, but not out there in some beyond, but also right here in the very crevices and guts of our own being. And then the final point, hyper objects, which I already alluded to earlier, are, they wake us up. But the point is to then see there's no deep difference between global warming and evolution and important aspects of this object in that every object ultimately withdraws from me while presenting it to me. Every object has a deep past a non-human future, and it may, you know, it doesn't mean it's gonna stay as an object, it may break up and affect other things. They're trying to get us to see, again, that this horror aspect of reality, while most prominent in hyper objects, is actually present in, the, in this weird present but absent sense in every single thing. The reason why I propose this to Jordan, and then I'll shut up and let him talk at length, is that I think the acceleration, that's a term that Morton actually uses, uh, and he talks about now we're in the age of asymmetry. Things are accelerating beyond, right? We are, we are entering into an increasingly asymmetrical relationship with reality. And I propose to Jordan that his account of the acceleration that's taking place right now is a bona fide example of a horrifying hyper object. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Whew. <laughs> yeah, I went through a whole bunch of uh, cycles. Uh, during that, but the, the last one was a, uh, uh, it, like had the feeling of when you spin a coin, yeah. like you've got a coin and you're holding a coin and you flip it. And you know, if you can imagine like a two-year-old watching, like, okay, neat. And then all of a sudden the coin's spinning and you look and the fucking coin's like standing on its own spinning. Yeah. It's like, yeah, whoa, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. So let's hold that last bit, right? Cause the last bit yeah. is an, is a, um, how's it work? <laughs> last bit's intense. Yeah. Uh, the last bit has to do with a Klein bottle inversion of the interior and the exterior. Yep, yep, yep. When we take the techno the technological output of our own agency as a hyper object itself. Yes. yes. So we begin yes. to discover the interior hyper object that produces an exterior hyper object like it's a yes. hyper objects all the way down. You want to talk about something that will break your mind? Be careful yep. if if your mind happens to be one that tends to like hold things in a model space, be careful of that one because that yep. will uh uh, or be sitting down when you do that one. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. So obviously a bunch of stuff. The The first few things that, that seem simple are like, I'm reminded of the, you know, the emergence of comp complexity and chaos theory yep. in the 80s. Yep. And a little bit of the, and specifically the notion of the reminder. You know, the, hey, hey guys, check it out. Yeah. yeah. You, you found a really cool little tool, you know, mm -hmm. linear analysis, calculus, differential equations, um, really cool. Like that's a cool tool. It does neat stuff. Guy, bad news for you. It actually only represents the thinnest possible portion of actual reality. Yeah. Yeah. We've been focusing on it a lot for the past couple hundred years because it's extremely powerful in the areas that it can deal. But with regard to actually huge chunks of reality, most of reality, it actually isn't the right tool. Right? Yep. So that was like, that was the big yep. epistemological, moral, oh shit, like I, we yeah. forgot. We've been actually yeah, yeah. kind of obsessively yeah. focusing on this narrow thing and kind of fighting over expanding the capacity of it because it's super cool. Uh, and it gives us all kinds of cool power like transistors and nukes, but, and airplanes and bridges and, well, not bridges, but yeah. ways of building bridges. Um, but it actually doesn't do deal with all kinds of other stuff like the immune system or weather or um, even financial systems, like all the whole domain that complexity is like, hey, by the way, complexity. So that's right. one, right? It's almost like just the demoralization of the meta paradigm of the enlightenment and saying, hey, cool, what you're doing is neat and is only a piece of a much larger story. So let's, let's take a look at that much larger story, all right? And the, in this case, the injection of, you said, like, words like horror of, and we kind of have to. This much larger story, on the one hand, can't escape from it. You know, we're immersed into it up to the up to the neck, or deeper, obviously. Um, and it's super impactful. We can't ignore it. Like it's actually hitting us more and more every day. So it's not the kind of thing where we can just sort of like pretend or try to build coping strategies by developing narratives that allow us to basically just be kind of the victim of uncertainty in hyper object space, um, and just 
well, you know, the gods got angry, I guess, move on, you know, which is kind of like how it's worked. Epistemologically, the way it's worked for human, humans is more or less categorizing the universe into spaces of, of now what we could just call objects, right. where we pretend, all right, what we do is we create an illusion of control. Hey, I actually can separate this jackknife from context and yeah. pretend that it's actually an object in this kind of Western um, content context inversion. Um, or we sort of punt on the context and put it in the mythopoetic narrative yeah. layer of shit happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, and by the way, our agency is irrelevant. You know, yeah. I could just act in complex nature, um, willy, sort of willy nilly, right. and try to control of it as much as possible. You know, yeah. fence it in and do agriculture, build buildings to keep out the weather, etc. And um, <laughs> and hope and expect that. You know, when shit, when a flood comes or uh, the, you know, the, a drought comes, it's just like, ah, shit happens. Right, right, right. And, you know, the point is that as we're reaching a level of maturity, frankly, like there's sort of an adolescent response to circumstances, we're reaching a level of maturity, which means also a level of responsibility. Yeah. Um, our own agency is increasingly obviously contributing to these hyper objects, yeah. but also the, the sort of the, the, boundaries of our capacity to control uh, are largely reached. And so there's a fragility built into yeah. that. Yes. And yes. small perturbations in hyper object space lead to large consequences in control space or object space. Yeah. And, you know, here we are. Now we have to actually deal with it. So it's kind of a now it's now it's not like the tap on the shoulder. It's a little bit of the slap in the face. It's like wake up from your, you know, from your hundreds of years of um, um, being what's the term like enraptured yeah. of this particular right. thing yeah. uh and addicted by the way enraptured yeah. and addicted to this particular thing and you know here's the horror whoosh mostly as a wake up like a cold bucket of water whoosh okay yeah. reality has always been thus this has always been the case many have told this story now it's time to actually come eye to eye with it yes so that's one arc um the next was the, for me, was the first person actual going through that process. So somewhat foolishly, <laughs> I found myself listening in the beginning of your narrative and un understanding it, meaning taking each concept as you introduced it, grasping the concept, running the implications of the concept, yeah. holding it as effectively a mental object. Then you added another piece, okay, doing the same thing. Then you added another piece. And it was somewhere around the one that looked like this, like the under and over. Yeah, yeah, yeah that I had effectively stack overflow. I was like, oh shit, I can actually, I can't hold this object. Right, oh, right. it's not an object. We're talking about <laughs> hyper objects. Of course, that's the point. So I actually first person had the first person experience right, of, right. of having to go through the process of shifting my interior relationship with the subject of the conversation, which happened to also be the object of the subject or the object right. of the conversation. So the, yeah. we were talking about how does we were doing the thing we were talking about. Yeah, we were exactly. And therefore, yeah. I actually had to undergo the transformation. The transformation was one of um, you know, shifting to a different mode, on a different mode of being in relationship. And when you're in relationship with an object, there's a particular mode, right? And we have, we have yeah. names for it. We have like engineering sure. is an object mode. Um, uh, planning, strategy, these are all object modes. Right. We can define discrete time frames, and we can measure. We can create statistical models that actually don't have things like long fat tail distributions. Right? We can actually create um, bound, bounded constructs that allow us to engage in a predictable um, uh, strategic agency over definable time frames. Right? That's all right. stuff that happens in object space. Yeah. But which doesn't mean that we're you know we're sort of fucked when we move out of object space. It just means there's a different mode. And, and I would say, and of course, you and I have been collaborating on this quite a bit, that a big part of the, the, the challenge of now is to, on the one hand, recognize that we've become highly over-dependent on the mode of choice-making or agency in object space, and, and as a consequence, have sort of become dependent on, addicted to, and um, underdeveloped in other modes of agency. So we have to consciously sort of recognize that addiction, step away from it, and then go through the process of building, rebuilding our mode of agency that is appropriate to hyper object space. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so if we've named different names, you could say, okay, just by hypothesis, cognition is a, is a, is a word that is appropriate for object space. And this right. other thing, distributed cognition, or if we'd like hypercognition, yeah. is appropriate to hyper object space. Yeah, yes. And, and by the way, there's a, an ordinary trap, which is happening now in, you know, in, the, in the interior, which um, it's one of the primary moves in the, in the Eastern tradition is, has to do with the notion of ego mind. You know, so yeah. one of the best tricks ego mind has is ego mind tries to pretend that it's given away the keys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah go ahead, do that. Yeah. Uh, no, totally. I say do that. Wait, you say do that. Yeah, yeah, I'm totally in charge. I'm not in charge at all. You know, I'm, in, I'm totally in charge of not being in charge. <laughs> so one of the challenges that we have is endeavoring to actually hmm, shift into hyper object space, into hyper object cognition, hyper object agency. But we try to do it from cognition space. Yeah. We try to still yeah. ground our in modeling it we want to model it we want to plan it we want to design it we want to engineer it we want to control it we want to be able to um you know do risk assessment on it and and sort of all of that is part of this other mode so we have to actually step into this into this new mode or it's actually an, a much older mode <laughs> yeah. simultaneously much much older and new right that, that's another key yeah. piece of this it's like it's like this new indigenous it's an intrinsic characteristic relevance realization right you've tried yeah, yeah. that term yeah. Relevance yeah. realization at an is is grounded in evolution, right? Right. grounded. It's groundedness. It's how a uh, an evolved um, choice making agent makes most effective choices in the context of complex reality. Yes, yeah. that's what it is. So it's not just indigenous to humans. It's like indigenous. <laughs> it's indigenous yeah. to evolution. Yeah, yeah. Um, our task is to simultaneously kind of recover or repair our our, our, our toxiness or our, our raw indigenousness, and then also step into a new tone of that, which, for example, now takes as its object the class of hyper objects. Right, right. Right. And we actually say, okay, we're no longer trying to simply respond to the obvious, not obvious, the, the for sure and yet oftentimes withdrawn. Sorry, I'm saying this poorly. Your jackknife. Yep. Uh, look at the jackknife. There's sort of two stages to it. One is, or three, one is the pre, oh, of course, it's part of a complex reality. Then there's the, oh, no, no, it's just an object. I can deal with it as a discrete object. Yep. And then there's the, oh, no, it actually is part of a complex reality. Yeah. Yep. And I can expand that and say, okay, well, in many cases, for the most part, our sort of traditional indigenous mode of hyper object was dealing with a particular territory. Right? It might be, you know, several hundred or several thousand square miles of physical land and water and, you know, the various kinds of environmental ecosystem dynamics yeah. and the species yeah. and yeah. stuff like that. But it never has dealt with the whole world. Right. Yeah. And so now for the first time, we're having to step back and say, okay, the whole world and probably actually like the region out to Mars or something like that. Yeah, it's yeah. like the hyper object scope that we have to learn how to take new responsibility for in the next major arc, like the next major piece of this story. And eventually, you know, larger and larger by hypothesis, but for now that. Right, right. Um, and if you kind of frame it that way, in some sense, it's, it's actually not, it's not that horrible. I mean, it's daunting, but not horrible. You're like, oh, oh, you know, if I'm, if I'm a two-year-old, the hyper object of like my house is, you know, it's a hyper object. Shit goes on. It's crazy. Like, wow, yeah. lights turn on and off and, you know, uh, suddenly food appears and it, it's gone and whoa, what the hell's going on? I can't, I can't grasp this thing. Uh, and by the way, same thing, like I'm in it. I, there's no way of escaping from it. Um, and yet at a certain point, we kind of grow to be able to have a fluid organic relationship with that particular scope of hyper object. And what happens, of course, is we expand, we expand our domain of care. We're like, oh, we can actually step out into a larger milieu. Um, no. Sorry, I think I think this is the last thing I'll say before I stop. Okay. Um, there's like these two modes here. These two modes that I keep talking about are, come in. There's the the organic mode, which unfortunately for the past several generations has actually been less and less. You know, but you can imagine the organic mode. You and I probably quite can of actually living the exploration of your environment. 
And so you get on your bike and you ride around your neighborhood or back in the earlier days, you would just walk and you begin to learn the features of the terrain and notice that the pond in this period of time is big and the pond in this period of time is small and this period of time is there's fish and this period of time there's turtles. And, you know, when the wind changes, like you get to notice the, the yeah. uh, extremely high dimensional signaling structure that is the interface layer between your perception and your agency in the context of the hyper object that is your milieu. Um, of course, these days we end up with a, a fork, which unfortunately happens like around one, where we actually don't even enter into the complex milieu. And we actually only stay in a complicated object defined milieu yeah. of like iPads and cars yeah. and schools and, you know, scarcely ever touch the complex environment, which means that we're hyper, hyper, and I'll use that term ironically, yeah. maladapted to the actual complexity, which we've always been in, right? I, yeah. I call this the... Yeah. The girl with the pink parasol. Remember her from uh, Heart of Darkness? Right, right. That story. Right. right she's, yeah. Oh, yeah, she's, that's one of my favorite short stories. Yeah. She, she, she lives innocently in the beauty of Edwardian England or whatever in London, um, utterly unaware of the darkness and horror and complexity of what the British Empire is and must be to afford yeah. her the yeah. garden she lives yeah. in. Uh, but it doesn't, it's the garden is not real. The complexity of the world is real. The British Empire is real. The garden is a artifact that is produced by that and is sustained by that. And she is utterly defenseless in the context of the larger world because she has no idea of the world that she's actually living in. To the degree to which we give our agency into these complicated machineries that are not even meaningfully of our actual design anymore, which separate us from the complexity of the world we are radically disempowering ourselves, right? So that's that, that piece of the story. Right. But to the degree to which we have a sense of a certain scope of hyper object that we naturally have learned how to be in some real um, you know, hyper agency with, and we got just got to call that naturalness, yeah. right? Yeah. The two words are beautiful because hyper agency puts it over here and naturalness puts it over here. And we realize they're actually the yeah. same. The challenge is to say, okay, to what degree can we use this modality of naturalness, of hyper-agency to achieve a responsibility or a responsiveness to this much larger scope, the world, the whole right. world. Yeah. That's it. Like that's, that's another way of saying, I think, the same thing. All right. That's my, uh, my pong. <laughs> so now, now, now I have to come up with a good thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there was a lot there that was very, very good. Um, so um, first of all, it sounded like my proposal of m mapping Morton's thought onto yours was well received. You, you were able to like really pick it up um, uh, very well. Uh, and so that, that means that uh, uh, we do have a good ground for further discussion. I wanted to pick up on a couple of, the, uh, a couple of things. Um, because you invoke the heart of darkness. And I remember, I mean, of course, Kurtz's famous line is the horror of the horror, right? Again, about this. A and I wanted to pick up on that because I was one because basically the aesthetics, and this is one of the criticisms I have of Morton is the aesthetics he, like, so when he says aesthetics, by the way, he doesn't mean like pretty, the prettiness of objects. He means the fundamental way in which you have disposed your sensibility, your mode, that the, the kind of mode you're talking about. Yeah. And then what he's proposing, if you'll allow me, it, he doesn't say this, so I'm making a connection. If you remember, I've talked about this before, Jonathan Wright talks about sensibility transcendence. And sensibility transcendence, it's, it's based on a, a famous example from Iris Murdoch in The Sovereignty of the Good, where Murdoch is talking about the, the attentional core of morality and are, are paying attention to things in the right way, right? Uh, you know, giving them the, the, their due regard is actually the core of all of morality. And she, and she gives the example of the mother-in-law and, and the daughter-in-law. And the, the, the mother-in-law right, thinks her daughter-in-law is unworthy of her son because she's sort of coarse uh, and she's loud. And, and that, but then she has this insight. She has this insight, well, maybe she's not coarse and loud. Maybe she's really present and grounded. Mm. And, that what, and what Murdoch points out is in order to have that, it's not just an insight about the object. It's also a retroflective insight about uh, her habitual framing of things. She has to give up the, how she frames her framing, if you'll allow me that. Like she has to allow that to shift in a fundamental way in order to, she, she has to let her understanding of what it is to be a good agent 
which she identifies with, fundamentally transform in order to see the daughter this way. Yeah. Now, now Wright calls that sensibility transcendence, which is this idea. So he co contrasts it to sort of Nagelian transcendence from Thomas Nagel. This is the transcendence we're more familiar with. This is where we move up to the view from above and we move to higher orders and bigger scope, and, right? And we can even move in from the concrete into the abstract. And we're very familiar with that. Sensibility transcendence is what you see in the mother-in-law. Her transcendence is not up and away. It's no, no, no. I'm going to allow my cognition to be tailored and fitted to you in your moreness and your suchness, mm. which is not the same thing as rising up through the taxonomy or rising up through spatial temporal context. It's like, no, no, no. And this is like Collingwood's idea of art, right? Uh, the, the th what art's primary function, according to Collingwood, is to remind us that things are not their categorical identities, which is a, like, right? And that, that's what sensibility transcendence is, is to have that insight, like to really remember that, oh, that, that there, <laughs> right, transcends my categories. And I need to therefore also transcend my categories for myself in order to come into right relationship, right? So that's sensibility transcendent. And what, what, what Morton is emphasizing with the aesthetics is that kind of sensibility transcendence. Is, is, that, is that okay so far? Great. Yeah. And then he thinks the primary thing that brings us into relationship to realism, reality, right, is to recognize has a sensibility transcendence to recognize how the object is outside of our anthropocentric framing. And he thinks that the, the aesthetic experience that points to that is horror. And then again, that's Kurtz. Uh -huh. Now here's my criticism of Morton. Kurtz is not the hero of the heart of darkness. Mm. Marlowe is. Mm -hmm. Marlowe, right? And the thing about Marlowe, and this is, you know, Conrad's story, you know, Marlowe is cultivating something where he can come into the right relationship of that which is horrifying without becoming what horror can do to people. Remember how Kurtz is described. He's clear in his mind, but mad in his soul. He lacks the capacity to do that sensibility transcendence to come into attunement. And Marlowe, well, right, but while coming into the, the horror, right, represents something else. And, and Conrad, of course, does this through imagery, and you remember at the end of, uh, of that where Conrad again invokes the heart of darkness, he portrays Marlowe as a sitting Buddha, mm. even uses the term, right? And he, so he's giving, and there's a couple references to that, and there's also some references to Stoicism, but the idea is Marlowe represents the opposite, right, uh, 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 Kurtz. And so I, I was trying to think about this. Sorry, this is long, but like, what, what, like, What's the sensibility transcendence that acknowledges the intimacy of the horror, but also remains in relationship? And what came to my mind then is Otto's notion of the numinous, because the numinous is simultaneously horrifying and fascinating. We are bound into it, and we are going through sensibility transcendence. That's what fascination literally means, mm. right? And, 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 the, and the horror, right? And, and the horror and the fascination are actually two facets of a deeper thing, which is the mystery of the thing. The fact that, right, our attempts to categorize it fail, right? But we are drawn into it nevertheless. So I was thinking about uh, this as a critique of Morton, which is he wants to claim that both postmodernism and environmentalism uh, fail. Because postmodernism, right, can't take it. Postmodernism, by trying to wrap everything into the text, I, I mean, one reading of postmodernism at least, I, I want to be very careful about that, right? By trying to wrap everything in, it, it, it keeps trying to point outside of the text while telling us that we're trapped inside the text, right? And so it can't really give us a relationship to hyper objects. And then what is surprising, because Morton considers himself an environmentalist, is he thinks that most of current environmentalism fails 
And this is something that's deeply intriguing to me because the persistent failure of environmentalism to solve the problem it addresses it's like, is, is, a, is, is an important feature that we, we need to acknowledge and take note of uh, if, we, if we really do want to save the world. And, he's, and his proposal is, is because environmentalism is, is, to use your language, is talking about all of this in object space. It's talking about all of this in object space and using the categories of modernity, even the category nature, as opposed to civilization, like this is a this is a modern category, right? Uh, this is a mo modern categorical difference. And if you remember, hyper objects persistently fall between the cracks of our uh, yeah, of yeah. our bespoke and beloved categorical distinctions. We think of them as exhaustive and complete, and the hyper object says, "No, no, no, wait, no, 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 no." Right? And so his thing is that. Uh, Postmodernism and modernism are still are, are locked, and uh, environmentalism is locked, and therefore we need a way out. But all he offers, sorry, I'm almost done, mm -hmm, is, is the aesthetic of horror. But I think what he most properly should be offering is the aesthetic of the numinous. Mm. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go even further. <clears throat> I would say. A, uh, a practicum of the numinous. Ah, yes, right? yes. So yeah. it's 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 like look, uh, you know, imagine uh, you know a science fiction story. Where you've just gotten on a rocket. You've been you you raised on Earth, and you've been taken to a uh, uh, you know a colony on you know in the in the uh, in Phobos. Right? So there's yeah. very very low gravity. Right, right. You have to learn how to get around. Yeah, yeah. It's not like insanity. It's just a new context, right? You're going to have to say, okay, well, how do you move? Well, you don't walk because every time you step, you jump off the moon. Yeah. All right. Well, you're going to have to like readjust. You're going to have to learn how to move in this new context, in this new environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say that's the thing. Right? We're, we're, there's a, um, an, a, a practicum. There's a, okay, here's the deal. There is this place over here. Well, again, kind of repeating. Yeah. Yes, completely agree. Yeah. environmentalism, socialism, postmodernism, capitalism. Oddly enough, they give us the sign. They all end in ism. <laughs> if it ends in ism, it fails for a particular reason, which is that at the end of the day, it endeavors to operate in object space using the agentic categories of object space. What's your plan? Oh, I don't know. You're in object space. Stop that. What's your strategy? You're in object space. Stop that. What's your movement? What's your narrative? These are all things that are adaptive to responsive in the category of object space. If you want to move and deal with things that are in hyper object space, you've got to go through that uh, decompression chamber and learn a new mode, right? A whole new mode of agency. Okay. You know, it's just, it's, it's Renaissance. This is the Renaissance, yes. uh, the second Renaissance. Yeah. yeah. Um, fair enough. We've done one before. The problem with that, you've done more than that if you understand history. And that's where we are. So I think that's appropriate. And the challenge of how do we operate, how do we actually have agency or even um, what I call sovereignty, right? Literally defining the term sovereignty was, well, in some cases, stealing the term and, and projecting it in a certain way, pinning it, saying, this is the thing. This is what's on the other side. Like once you go through that decompression chamber, you're discovering this new form of sovereignty that is grounded in this hyper object space and is appropriate and responsive to the hyper object space. So what does it look like? You know, and then we can jump, it's very practical. It looks like practicing meditation first. Why? It's not the end, you know, it's the beginning. You get to the, what's it, uh, theory U, you get to the bottom of the U. Yeah. What, is, what does that mean? Well, to get to the bottom of the U is to actually exit consciously and effectively the totality of object space, yes. right? All the habits of mind that move through space by first and foremost instantiating some set of categories space-time categories, um, cause, causal categories, right? That entire, yeah. you actually can get to the bottom of the Kantian proposition and recognize as any good meditator has, oh, there's actually places below this. Yes. I can get to, right? When you get to those places below it, yes. now you're no longer sitting ob uh, obligate, unconsciously, habitually, or addictively in the modes of behavior in object space, the modes of sovereignty in object space. So now, now the challenge is the practicum of the numinance. 
how do we come from the bottom of the U, not just sit there, but actually begin the process of stepping out of that. And this is very odd, but it's very practical. I mean, like literally standing, like literally staying in the bottom of the U and then doing something like opening your eyes and looking around yes. or uttering a single sentence, you know, the simplest stuff, because you're actually having to relearn the whole way of being a being in the world so from this new dispositional ground. Rehabilitation in the original meaning of the word. Yes, rehabilitation, exactly. There's a rehabilitation process. And as you go through that journey, or at least now I can go first person, as I have gone through that journey, right? Because I'm telling you the story that I, I came to these conclusions. I willy-nilly found myself kind of bouncing off the bottom of the U without understanding what was up. Um, going through the horror process, grasping the size of the, of the problem, recognizing that the entire right. category of categories can't solve it, having no idea what to do next and beginning to go. Um, failing, finding out where the blind spots were, like, you know, triggers, what they call triggers. Triggers are things that pop you out of this new disposition and kind of teleport you or put you on a greased slide into some kind of behavioral perceptual mode that was developed in a previous version of your psychology in response to or using largely tools from object space. And yeah. so when you get triggered, you fall out of hyper object agency and into a pretty poor and also for sure object agency. So you'll have things like suddenly you'll notice if you actually can notice your own consciousness when you get triggered, a whole bunch of categories pop up. Yes, very much, very much. Um, and a whole bunch of responses pop up. Now, you could tease that apart, but at any point you get it, right? There's a whole series of practicum associated with the numinous. And in that practicum of the numinous is also beautifully the emergence of an entirely novel form of collaboration. Right, yes. Mm, can I hit on this for a little bit? Yes, please. So I wanna hammer on this particular concept. Um, there are distinct forms, and I'm just gonna use that, the you metaphor. Right? So the distinct yep. forms of what I'll call, just I'll say distributed cognition on yep. either side of the you. Right. Mm, mm, all right. Yep, yep. On this side of the U, which is to say in category space, in object space, distributed cognition takes the form of, I'm going to call it coordination. Yep. Yep. And we have a great metaphor for it would be like Internet of Things is yep. coordination, right? Yep. So there's some kind of finite protocol and right? some sort of semantic object that defines uh, how any object in universe can be categorized and some sort of state space of available actions that can be triggered by some change in the state of environment mm -hmm. and signaling some sort of finite signaling protocol um, that, uh, that can modify state positions in this state space. Right. So right. Use a computational metaphor, coordination. And yeah. that, what's an example of coordination outside of Internet of Things? Well, capitalism. Yeah. What does capitalism do? Capitalism converts complex reality into a very large menu of objects yes. with a very small menu of actions, yes. mostly exchange, right? Now, capitalism presents itself as saying, hey, I'm on the inside of a, of a circle. On the outside of the circle is complex reality. So I'm going to take a tree and exit it out of complex reality, yeah, yeah. enter it into complicated yeah. reality and convert it into yeah. lumber. Yeah. We're going to engage in a a uh, finite state transaction. It costs $15 for this piece of lumber. Right. You're not going to manipulate it however you like in this in capitalism space. And you may exit it back out in the form of a chair, which right. now is entering into your complex life as you're sitting on it, right? So saying I'm doing this. Yeah. But of course, we find that it tends to do this, expands and puts more and more of life inside the boundary yep. of this uh, complicated coordination structure. Right. And we find ourselves increasingly. And so think about this from human relationships. You know, how much of life these days is governed by complicated coordination structures? We've talked about this many times. Yes, very much. How, many, how much of your food, like when you make a meal, take a look at the full set of human agency that is manifested in that meal. Yep, very much. What fraction of that was provided by coordination? Yeah. These days, the vast majority of it, possibly all of it. If you bought it, you know, if you bought your food from a retail establishment, yep. the last thing that's not coordination is your ass eating it and everything else was, you know, yep. driven by coordination structures. Okay. On the other side of the U, 
right? So we come to the bottom, we're coming back up and we're learning how now to play together again as a distributed cognition. But now in this new numinous practicum, yes, this yes. is what I've been calling coherence. Right. right? So coherence. Oh, this is very helpful, Jordan. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it would might be. Yeah. Coherence is the name that I use to describe what distributed cognition looks like on the other side of the U. Right, right, right. Um, or is, looks like and is. And it's different, right? It, there's a whole different sensibility to it. Now, of course, we experience it all the time. If we are dancing the tango with a, with a partner, we're definitely not engaging in coordination and very little discussion and you know, negotiation and transaction. More like a discovery of the high dimensional fluidity that is naturally available to humans in a natural context. Right. Um, we can also do, by the way, coherence with a tree. You know, this is what the, the stories every every artist is that they feel yep. some kind of relationship with the affordances of the possibility of that complexity. So when we dive back into complexity on the other side of the U, we're actually just diving back into complexity. This opens up all the other words, right? The horror now shifts to joy as we realize that this always was our natural state. And as we become more and more competent, as we become more and more artful of navigating more and more of complex reality in its own terms, then all kinds of things. This is where meaningfulness comes from. Yep, the other yep. side of the U is the ground of meaningfulness. Right. That's great. That, I mean, I mean, of course, you've talked to me uh, many times before about coherence and I, I, you know, I've, I've gotten different, but that was a new facet of it. I mean, coherence is itself a, a hyper object, um, yeah. right? right? Uh, that, that was very helpful. So I, I, want, I want to pick up on, on, on that because you, had the, you, you, were, you were specifying some dimensions of the practicum. One is the meditation, the mindfulness dropping. So there's the meditative practice, but there should, and these two need each other, right? The, the meditative practice is instead of dropping below the categorical space, if I can put it that way, the object space, but you also need the contemplative practice that exposes you to the hyper objects, right? And, and beyond that transcend because they break through the cracks or they're more encompassing than the object space. So you, you need also the, and, and each needs the other because each, each, each counterbalances and corrects the mistakes of the other. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things you can write, one of the things that, happens here of course is i can i and the buddha constantly warned about this I, I i i can become indolent it's so it's so it's so peaceful at the bottom of the u it's just so it's so peaceful i can just ah, right and that's weird because that brings a weird kind of crypto egocentrism back in that's not mm. being recognized in that state right so if i and if, if i just do the opposite if i just contemplate without having done the meditation i'm going to project like crazy I'm going to project and misrepresent, right? But if I don't do this, then I won't properly do sensibility transcendence, right? And so the two are constantly checks and balance. And then I thought, and then there's a, a, a practicum, which is a practicum of being in distributed cognition that is constantly, continually in contact with both of those poles in a dynamic coupling. And that's what I call the logos. That's what mm -hmm. I mean by, by the logos. The logos is not about object exchange communication. The logos is, can we get distributed cognition so that people are, and you're doing this in, in these practices, you're reaching in, which if that's even the right metaphor, with mindfulness, you're reading, reaching out with contemplation, and then you're trying to do the dynamical coupling that is at the core. You're trying to, in Eckhart's, you're trying to give birth, make space for the logos for something numinous beyond everybody that is a member of the distributed cognition. Mm -hmm. So I would say there's there's sort of the three dimensionalities at least to the practicum. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, another word that I would just throw in there was Nietzsche's term levity, you know, to just oppose it, oppose it to gravity. Oh, right, right, yes. Right, to become a dancer, to become uh, one that can fly, like this mode of agency that happens when you're moving you know, dialogos, if you, you know, properly construe it, isn't just docking, right? Dialogos oh, is sure. um, you know, carving, it's building, it's writing software, right? It's, it's, a, it's a mode of relationality with, with, with outside, right? a mode of relationality, full stop, mode of relationality that right. has a particular disposition, a different quality to it. And so Nietzsche termed that levity, which I thought was a, 
is a nice term to throw into the mix. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff, right? Things that begin to show up. And these are, many of them become quite simple. And when you're holding that dual mode of meditation and contemplation, there's always the, also always a curiosity and orientation towards the, what's going to emerge. Huh, yeah. I wonder what's yeah. going to happen next. That's interesting. Wonder. Right? Wonder. wonder, right? You're no longer, yeah. you're no longer, a, you're like planning. You're not trying to make a point. You're actually curious about a, what, what, what will emerge in this space that has now been yeah. opened up, right? The space yeah. of possibility is now rendered available. Like you've, that's the point. And it's, it's actually, that is the point. You're creating the space, possibility. Now I'm curious, wonder what will happen. You also have an orientation towards your interior. Like you're always noticing how your interior is a constantly shifting complex milieu of itself. And so many things are arising and being, that are being shown there. And you're holding them also in a space of curiosity and wonder. Oh, I just got angry. Oh, I just got frustrated. Oh, I just felt allurement, like whatever it is. Like the feelings don't drive behavior directly. The feelings emerge and then are allowed to actually speak into this wonderfully interesting space with, again, held with curiosity and wonderment. So, um, so if I can just riff on that point right there, because this is actually a point I've been making uh, in uh, The Elusive Eye with Greg Enriquez and Christopher Mastapietro on the nature and function of the self. The self, or, or may, perhaps an older term, the psyche is a hyper object. It's mm -hmm. a hyper object to your working memory, to your current state of consciousness. And this is ancient. Heraclitus said, you know, you can't find the bounds of the psyche because its logos always transcends itself or its yes. logos is unlimited, right? And so, and, and this is Harman, one of Harman's points. We have to realize we have to give up the Cartesian sense that we fully grasp ourselves. We also withdraw from ourselves. There's also a moreness and suchness to us about our psyche. And, and so he, he actually says that one of the things we can, and you can think about how this goes with my notion of participatory knowing, by, and, it, this, and this amplifies what you said, by really tuning into the way I exceed myself, right? The way I, the, the logos, the psyche has a logos that transcends itself. I can fully participate and appreciate how everything also withdraws to mm. itself and is beyond itself. And it's not a thought anymore. It's something that I'm enacting. And, you know, and, and, and Morton talks about, you know, when you're reaching for the cup, you, you're personifying the cup, but at the same time, you're allowing the cup to cupify you, right? Um, and, and, and that sort of notion there. Um, about why this has, to, it's not just, it's not just a, a, you know, a helpful tool to be tuning in as you're also, you know, attuning outward. It is a constitutive thing you have to do, or you're really not coming into the right relationship. Yes. I, I, in some sense, like the phrase that comes up is something like, you know, until you have learned fully what it means to have unconditional love for and with and from yourself, it is in fact both impossible and hmm, how do you say it? Like inconceivable yes. that you can do this with someone else and from someone else. And right? so you will misconstrue other people and you will misproject onto other people because you haven't yet been able to hold it just in your own self, which, you know, as you said, the boundary of, of psyche is infinite. Yes. Uh, so even just the within your own self, if one learns how to do that with one of oneself, one is doing it now in relationship with something that is unbounded. And that's the point. Now you have right relationship with the unbounded. And that's that disposition, like the dispositions of things like, well, love is sort of the core word, right? Yeah. Unconditional to make space for emergent possibility with curiosity, right? Things like that. Like those are things yeah. that begin to show up as part of the practicum of the numinous. Um, now, just to put a pause, this is on the other side of the U. And what happens oftentimes is that if you haven't gone through the process of going through the other side of the U, many of these terms, concepts, notions, propositions are translated yes. back into object space where they are yeah. misconstrued inevitably. Yes. It's a, it's, a, it's a profound instance of Fromm's modal confusion. We're staying in the, in the manipulation of object space, the having mode, and then we keep framing things from the being mode in having mode terms. Yes. Yeah. Right. So the, 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 the difficulty then is, um, the difficulty is then, I, I, I guess, a fourth dimension of the practicum, which is 
how do we get a self-reflective, self-corrective practice within the meditation, contemplation, and, and, and dialogos? Those are already self-correcting and self-reflecting, but a practice that is specifically directed towards, no, 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 the modal confusion, this sort of er modal confusion. Uh, yep. No, 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 right? Uh, we need a practice that it will continually re remind us uh, of our proclivity to trying to subsume um, the hyper object space into the object space. Yes. Well, there's uh, the learnings that I've had. Um, well, and I would even make it even more um, pointed because for me, this is highly practical, which is um, practically, how do we actually do it uh, in, in the time frame that is reasonable? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, for example, there's a whole complex of what we call psychotechnologies, right? Yep. So now we invoke metapsychotechnology as the object or the hyper object that helps bind and f define the collection yep. of psychotechnologies associated with exactly that problem. And there are answers to this question that are relevant in the context of a single individual. So yes, there, it is possible as a single individual to achieve that level of sort of stability on the other side of the you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't, but I've heard that others maybe can. <laughs> we certainly notice we, we have names for those kinds of people, you know, saints and enlightened ones. Yep. However, this is a good news. It appears to be the case that although there is a sort of an additional challenge or an injection of additional complexity when you bring new people into the hyper conversation, there also is a shift in that set of psychotechnologies that how we help each other do that, mm -hmm. right? And it, and it turns out so far as I can tell that it is in fact, in some sense, let's say easier to achieve stability of this sort in the context of a Sangha yes. than it is to do so in the context of a Buddha. Yeah, that, that's, that's what cognitive science is moving towards. Mm. That however we want to, well, and we've talked about this, so I'm just gonna use it as again as a term, However, we want to think about it. Um, the evidence is converging. You know, Greg has work on this, the justification hypothesis idea. And then you've got work of Mercier and Sperber and other people, you know, Hutchins, but especially, uh, uh, you know, in, in the recent book, The Enigma of Reason, the, the evidence that we, and I'm speaking here probabilistically, not deterministically, but we are much more likely to uh, achieve better problem solving in distributed cognition than we do in individual cognition. Not, oh, yeah. only because, not only because of sort of just sheer increase of computational power, but also because of the fact that if we frame it right and we can misframe it, we can, we can go, no, homogeneity, groupthink. No, no, adversarial processing. But if we avoid, if we find the middle path between those, we can get opponent processing where your egocentrism and my egocentrism you can use my egocentrism to transcend yours, and I can use my, your egocentrism to transcend mine. And this is why, I, this again, why I think dialogos is so important, uh, yeah, because yeah. it is the way of trying to say um, it, exactly what you said. It encourages us. It gives us hope that we don't have to individually become the Buddha, because the Sangha has a potential that doesn't require us to be Buddhas, to nevertheless itself be a Buddha. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And you know, some very simple reasons why this might, why this is the case, you know, things like statistically, it's extremely unlikely that my legacy triggers and your legacy triggers are the same. Yes. So yes. what that means now is that we have a portfolio of uh, coherence, meaning that if something comes along that sort of randomly triggers me, I may drop out of coherence, but you don't. Right. So now right. you're in a place where you can actually come from a place of coherence and help me yep. find a context that brings me back into coherence, which might be a simple thing. You know, and by the way, my collaboration with Vanessa and now with our daughter has been just this. Like this has been the, yep. the, the reason why we became partners was this. Right? This is what we're doing. This is our sort of yeah. Uh, yeah. Our, our mutual collaborative project. Literal coupling. Literal coupling and the and examples like simple examples like hmm I noticed that swimming in the ocean is a great way for you to get grounded again. 
you know, I know that, so there's like, we, we've developed whole protocols like shit when I'm, you know, totally going in this direction, here's like four or five things that are kind of likely things to re- just, just to rec- recommend or remind that I'll probably have lost track of because I'm in, I'm no longer okay. sovereign yeah. yep. and just being able to provide those, like I'm doing very, very analytically radically increases the probability of me doing them. And we've yep. identified them as radically increasing the probability of me finding my ba- way back into sovereignty. Cool. Right? There's a lot if, of basic things. If you're willing to bind your identity to the person. Though. If you're ed- we're willing to actually enter into that contract. Yep. yep. If that's an agreement, if, if that's a mutual agreement, and it has to be a mutual agreement. And it can't look like this. Like this is from the, in uh, object space, relationships look like that. Yeah. And that's a binding in, in object space. Yep. In hyper object space, relationships look like that. Yes. Yes, very much. Continuity of contact rather than closure of control. Yes, very yep. much. Yeah. Um, which has its own challenges and risks, right? It's, it, everything but, has got its own stories. But it also has its own beauty. Of it, course, yeah. It's not properly captured. So, I mean, that model, I mean, I mean, and that's that, that you know, and this is what I'm, because I'm deep in this literature. This is the classic platonic model, right? If we have, what, what we can do is we can, we, we can increase plausibility. We, your biases and my biases, your triggers and my triggers, like, right? So plausibility is when I have many independent lines. And so what we, we come to is not due to the bias or the idiosyncratic triggers of each independent entity. I increase trustworthiness, but I also now get the possibility of elegance. I get the possibility of emergence because you and I can afford each other's self transcendence. So what we get is we get a circumambulation of, uh, that generates plausibility to use a sort of platonic metaphor, right? We yep. have a bunch of people are, around the topic, right? And, and we converge on it uh, in a trustworthy fashion. And then it broadcasts back to us like global broadcast. Um, it, it, it's emergence, elegance, new ideas, new insights that we all can share in. So it's not only that we give each other, you know, affordances around triggers, we also give each other insights that take us beyond where we were. All right. Now let's throw in religion. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, because I think we can actually, we can make it very simple. I mean, gosh, people get so wound up about stuff. So, so what's religion? Religion is the, the recognition of the utility and the necessity of, of taking advantage of the objective to support, to offload the cognitive load of trying to actually maintain the various states associated with collective coherence. Mm. Right. So for example, um, trying to remember to do, to stretch, just to literally stretch, right? Trying to remember to stretch every day. If I'm running it in pure individual Jordan cognition, ain't gonna work, right? Uh-huh. Right. All kinds of stuff, even just like drink enough water, like fill in, just like take simple stuff, but drink enough water, stretch every day. Just go drink enough water. Like I was supposed to drink X amount, right? I discovered over the last week because I shifted from Hawaii, which happens to have an, a hyper abundance of water just in the ambient environment to San Diego, which is a desert. And my body's like, what the hell happened? Yeah. Oh, I don't drink enough water. Okay. What if I bind some phenomena in objective reality, like say, um, every time that I eat, I also drink, you know, so I notice that eating emerges very easily. You know, eating happens. I'm going to eat. And if I just notice that eating and drinking have to be bound, and this seems banal, but I'm just making a very simple banal example. Yeah, 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 yeah. If I can create that binding that a particular behavior that is triggered by something in objective reality or an easier one, um, every sunset we all choose to stop what we're doing and we go outside and we hold a moment of silence while we watch the sunset. Right. right. Well, what are we doing? There's a whole bunch of like high, high quality psychology benefits of yep. disconnection from what you're doing, breathing, yep. Yep. You know, even just like we call it sun spectrum. Like there's a whole bunch of stuff and the sun's going down every day. Right? Right. So I don't have to remind myself to go do a breathing practice. If I bind a breathing practice to watching the sunset go down, now I get the support of the scaffolding of the fact that I happen to live in a causal objective universe to allow me to have the set of behaviors that I've already identified as being highly constitutive of my ability to maintain myself on the other side of the view. Right? So that piece, ritual, right, yeah. is one side of religion. 
another side of religion. Hmm, hold on. The other side of religion is a little bit harder to get a hold of, but it's something like this. It's like um, thoughtful, careful, careful. One might even say sacred partitioning. Ah, vocation. There we go. Right, right, right. The other side of religion is this term vocation. Right? Yep. And vocation is to say, hey, it, where you are uniquely capable because of your natural proclivities and aesthetics to, to provide high quality care with regard to some piece of shared livingness, there lies your vocation. Yes. To the degree to which we can collectively provision our shared needs by means of individuals sitting in their vocation, the likelihood that the things that we're doing are going to be constitutive to our health and well-being is extraordinarily higher. Yes. So I need to eat food. Growing food is not my vocation. Right? So in some sense, somebody else is going to be growing the food that I'm going to be eating. Now, I can do that through coordination. And I can go to the grocery store and pay an anonymous farmer, by the way, probably far away from me in space and time. But now I have very little awareness of both the implications of what the food is coming to me is all about, right? who knows what's actually happening, and also the implications of what my causal consequences going out are. Who did yeah. I enslave en route to this production, right? Things like ethical capacity just gets ameliorated by chains of coordination. Yeah. By contrast, if I'm living in a place with a person, people who are committed to permaculture and it is their vocation and they're growing food right over there and they're part of my community and I know them and I support them with my vocation, the causal chains in both directions are both short, but also extremely certain. Right? Right. The likelihood that somebody who's eating the food they grow and they're growing it because it's their vocation, not their job, yeah. um, that that food is going to be healthy and, and well, you know, well considered for me is much, much higher, right? Vastly higher. Right. Um, and so this is another piece of religion, right? Religion is that how do we orient things so that the probability that the, con the, the, com the pieces, the components of our whole well-being are well held by a wholeness of communitas. Right, yes. And that's different than straight coherence, right? Coherence is sort of a means by which we can make sure that everyone is actually oriented towards their vocation and supported by a wholeness that allows them to have what they need. Like it's a means for that. Yeah. But religion is more like the, the practical implementation of it. Like how do we actually accomplish it? And how do we sort of go through the process of discovering where we're doing it well and where we're doing it poorly and the various rituals that then yeah. give us the appropriate structure to be able to go about doing it um, repairing so a ritual of like church like gathering together think about that like what's the what's the point here's the point first we create a space where we all or enough the appropriate size of us gathers together by the way not too many and not too small mega church bad idea too many people can't do it 150 people probably a really good size right yeah. so people who maybe aren't always interacting with each other we gather together we create a very particular process a certain amount of time and space that slows things down regrounds them, probably seeing things like singing or breaking bread that allow us to reorient and just be conscious of what it's like to be in coherence with each other, support each other through a variety of gratitude practices. And um, in Hawaii, it's the ho'oponopono, like the uh, absolution, coming yeah. back into right relationship practices so that everybody's on the same page, you know, healing and coming back into wholeness as community. Then ideally what happens is, is then the group, the gathered, the gathered uh, church, go through a process of actually engaging in this sort of stochastic um, Dunbar level relational dynamic where people begin to be engaged in pairwise and small group conversations in very high bandwidth, yeah. now super supported high bandwidth because the container has been created to hold them in a space of coherence, which is going to be doing a whole bunch of stuff about negotiating. Hey, you know, I got to say the other day, I really felt like you dropped the ball here. I apologize, you know, all that kind of stuff, which needs to happen anyway. But now the container has been created to, to enable that to occur, right? That's what we're trying to do. Like that's that object. That's what's ha supposed to be happening in that space. Um, and all the psychotechnologies that are built into that object are ideally thoughtfully designed to support the context to enable that process to play out, right? That's also religion, 
right? That's what we're talking about. When we talk about religion as a function, that's the objective. That's the thing it's there to do. That's great. Uh, that was really beautiful. Um, I think that's very convergent with uh, a line of thought I've been developing. So I'll, I'll put a sort of cognitive science spin on it, where I think, uh, and you're picking up on religio, right? The, the, the binding, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, religion as imaginally augmented, like augmented reality, uh, imaginatively augmented serious play that affords people the ability to get into the right relationship with themselves, with each other, and with the universe at large. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, the I, the, and we've been talking about this a lot, but this gives me another way of talking about something we've talked about before, which I think you're alluding to, which is the religion that's not a religion. Because the, the, problem, the problem we face is that that is, that is well, well, religion is a hyper object, right? Um, it, it is the kind of thing that is prototypically prone to being confused in that modally confusing way we talked about before. Yep. Where, right, where, where, and, you know, and Kars talks about this and, uh, when he talked, when he contrasted religion with belief. Belief is about moving into object space, right, moving into complicated, coordination, right, creating structure, right, in that way. And then he talked about religion is basically like religio, right, this, 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 right, this use of imaginally augmented serious play so that we can do that kind of sensibility transcendence, we can attune to, we can do the, the, the meditation in, the contemplation out, the dialogue, the dialogos between, right, and, and he, you know, and he said the first one is a, a finite game, the second one is an infinite game, and what's interesting is he, he points out a, 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 an important characteristic uh, about the grammar. So there's right, there's winners in the finite game. There's no winners in the infinite game. Um, and that reminds me of Plato's contrast between philia Nikea and philia Sophia. Uh -huh. Because one of the moves you're allowed to make in the finite game is to change the rules by which the game is played. Mm -hmm. Right. So so uh, in fact. The, the aesthetic of this is to be able to do that. It reminds me of when I was talking with Bernardo Castro recently. And, you know, and we come in and we're, you know, we come from different philosophical positions and there's an originally debate. And that's appropriate because we're, we're talking about science and that it has its place. But Kurt was very good because he also sort of called, uh, called us out and said, well, can you try and move into what John calls dialogos? And then we were doing that. And this was even more the case in the second one. Um, and, and I want to talk about a move that I sort of discovered, but anyways, because um, what happened is we started to move from, I, I, you know, I, my position should win, your position to lose, to, no, no, how can we, like you start to, uh, you start to appreciate the beauty of the dance as opposed to trying to get to the satisfaction of the victory. There's a, there's a, there's a deeply profound shift in which both people start to realize, oh, this itself, let how can we do this and how right and, and so that that like constantly being able to shift the 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 rules and one of the one of the things i did as a very practical thing is this was in between the, the two talks i went away and i thought okay bernardo's really sharp and he was really you know he was really present he was really engaged how can i be properly responsible to that and so i went and i thought and then i talked to other people i talked to matt segal and i did some and i thought what I should try and do is I should try and move towards his position, not as a sign or, or a prediction that I'm going to finally agree with him, but just moving. Mm. What can I derive from my position? What can mm. I give and what can I derive that will move me towards his position so that he will see me as being responsible rather than me just claiming it? And then what that might do, and in fact did, is it will trigger him to respond in kind. And then you get this kind of thing happening. Um, and so I, 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 I'm one, like, you see what I'm trying to get at? The religion that's not a religion yeah. is really, is, can be, it's, it's trying to, it's trying to get that self-reflective, corrective thing to saying, don't stop trying to put this into object belief space. Oh, I like that. Object belief space. That's good. Right. Instead, no, what you have to do is you have to keep thwarting that. You, keep, you have to build in the infinite game. You have to be able 
can constantly shift, right? So that it doesn't, it doesn't do that. It doesn't do that. Yeah. So let me, let me recharacterize what you said there in a, mo uh, a moment ago. Mm. Hmm. And in so doing, endeavor to do the thing that you were talking about, but also to help bring out some of the, some of the risks or error conditions yeah, that can sometimes yeah. show up. So you said, try to find a way that I can move my position towards his position, right? As a sign of the dance. Well, hold on, hold on. But yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. even it's like a sign, yeah. like there's such a complexity. If you're sitting on this side of the U, right. you get confused. And by the way, you tend to get like, what is it, hostile or defensive, right? There's a whole bunch of stuff that happens on yeah, this yeah, side yeah. of the U because the ego is in charge and that's what the ego does. Um, I'm confused, defend. Uh, let's see, so if you're in this side, you don't mean bullshit yourself into saying things he says. You don't mean yep. um, pretend to say things that you don't really believe. Right? You don't mean any of that, right? Yeah. None of that, the whole, that whole category. Like I can give more examples. And the hypo what I'm trying to say is each example is a part of a whole category and that whole category, not that. What yep. you mean is something like, and it feels to me, it feels very organic. It's like find the sun, the sunlight that is shining from the direction that he is coming and the aspect of you that is most available to emerge a growth bud of greenness, a green shoot in that direction, yes. right? More like that, like really sit and listen. Like, okay, I'm just going to keep rotating this conversation until I feel something shows up where there's like a, oh, like a warmth and a, yep. and like a, yep. Yep. you know, like a coziness or a yearning of, ah, okay. And now I'm not, I'm not bullshitting myself. I'm not, I'm actually growing. I am growing from my own interior sense of the, my own highest values are actually being supported. And I'm actually giving myself an affordance to grow. Yeah. And, and, and in so doing, right, simultaneously actually showing, hey, I heard you because yeah. Yeah. your heart's greatest yearning is endeavoring to express itself through the things that you're saying. And goddamn language is terrible. So yep. I'm acknowledging that I can't hear you. I can't hear you. The words you're saying create all kinds of barriers, but I'm listening. Yes. And here, here's what just happened when I listened. Yeah. Did, do you feel that listening yeah. occurred? And when a felt sense of, oh yeah, listening occurred, why? Because I actually grew in that direction. And that direction right. is a direction that you can feel as towards you, or more importantly, towards the thing yeah. that is expressing itself through you, the source that you are in a growth from. Like, think about that. Like, imagine the notion that there is some source, your soul, to use yeah. that language, right? And from birth, you have been feeling reality from that source, and everything that's in alignment with that source is allowed to accumulate on that source. Yeah. And everything that's more in alignment with that feels more in alignment with your soul. Right? So then when your soul and the other person's soul grow in the same direction, like, whoa, okay, yeah, yeah. that's much, much deeper than anything that could ever have been communicated in language. And it gives language its proper place, right? Which is basically, it's a fucking envelope, yeah. right? The, the words are the envelope. They are not the poem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The words are not the poem. Yeah. Keep working through that. If you're, if you're on this side of the U, every time you hear a word, it's just an envelope. Open it up. Yeah. inside is something it cannot be worded if it's worded it ain't it's still more envelopes just keep going yeah. until you finally have no more envelopes and yet there's still a something so the poesis in the language is a facet of the autopoesis of the individual Ooh, yeah yeah so then let's go to that last piece i think okay. we have a little bit of time left I've got about two minutes, actually. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's tackle the problem of acceleration in the technosphere. Yeah. So we have, um, well, I'll throw one thing out then, just like a, a little tiny one, but I think it's so quite nice. It, we can pick it up in the next, in the next discussion, if you'd like. Good. Yeah. So let me, let me put an entree, and I'll put an entree or, or a, uh, an apertif. Yeah. Um, what's the problem of the technosphere? The problematic. Uh, the problematic of the technosphere, which just has to do with this fact that our hyperobject self has as one of its characteristics, uh, it expresses itself in the form of, of technology, which is to say in the form of changes in reality. 
And the technology is simultaneously a hyper object and has its, its characteristic. It actually deepens the complexity of all the other hyper objects with which, with, with which we are in relation. Yeah. And it's viscous with us. It's in us. It transforms us to our core. It's not just yes. out there as an object that we manipulate. So there are two problems, uh, I think, at, at the core of it, right? One problem is, is straight up weaponization. Yep. Right? So this goes back to of, of all the other stuff that happens on this side of the U. Right? Yep. The, the egoic use of technology, you know, the degree to which technology is some weapon to control and or conquer, right? Control nature or control and conquer other people or yourself as the case may be. That's a whole category, right? And in some sense, we can say it's not that. Now, there's some complexity in how do we step away from weaponization? How do we resolve the game theoretic problematics associated with, well, if I stop doing it and they don't, then right, all that, a whole bunch there. But then you have another one, right? So I just want to put these two out there. The other one is the wonderment, the nobility, the, the, the beauty of the curiosity of, well, yeah, but I really want to explore impossibility and create new things. Right? The actual, like the deeper thing, like everybody who right now is called, let's say, mostly unfortunately acting as agents of out of control, accelerating technology, mm -hmm. almost certainly when they were four, six, 10, 12, were just curious and playfully finding that there were really interesting things that they could do that created new possibility and noticing that there are ways to solve problems by creating new possibility, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to hold that, right? We want to kind of take that first category, weaponization, and we want to unwind that. The second one, we want to hold in the right place, right? Yes, more creation of possibility. That's a part of the human story. It's part of levity. It's what we want to do. And also, not recklessly, right? Not assess obsessively. And how do we hold that well on the other side of the U? All right. So one thing I'll say is, I think that circles us back to the role of the numinous. The role of the numinous as being that which helps hold us. Because if we think of it as we holding ourselves, we're back in the ego space. Mm. We need to be in right relationship to something in which we are held mm. rather than something that we just simply hold. So I'm going to put that as, a, as an initial response that we can pick up next time. Nice. All right, man. Great. I'm glad to be back in sync with you. Yeah, me too. That was wonderful. Right. Okay. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye-bye.